Father, we thank you for this day and Father, for the blessings that you give your children each day. We're grateful, Father, for your love and for the sacrifice of your son. We're especially grateful that we have your word that we can rely on. A word, Father, that never changes, that never falters, that will remain the same from the time it was written until the time we get to heaven. Grateful, Father, for your love each and every day that you're with us. And this morning, Father, we pray a special prayer for our brother, Brother Terry. We pray if it be your will, Father, that he might be restored to his health and returned to us. For the many others, Father, that I'm unaware of, that might need our prayers, we pray for them as well. We pray, Father, for our country and for our people in this time of stress. Help us, Father, to not have a spirit of fear, but a spirit of strength, for we know that we are your children. And we know, Father, that you, your will will be done, irregardless of what goes on round about us. We're grateful for every opportunity that we have to come together, that we draw strength from each other. Father, that we can know and love each other and that we can help each other through trying times. Be with us this morning as we open your precious word. Help us to understand the things that you want us to know. Help us to use them and apply them in our life. And Father, when we fall short, we're thankful that through prayer we have an advocate, Christ Jesus, that our sins can be forgiven. Bless us this morning now in our efforts, we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Open your Bibles to Luke chapter 22. <clears throat> Last week we went on down a little further, but I want to back up just a little bit. And we're going to begin in verse 27 this morning. There's several things that I, I want to really impress that I think we really need to grasp about signs and wonders and different things to help put this together, to help settle it in our minds. The destruction of Jerusalem was a, a magnificent, outstanding, whatever you want to call it, point in history. It was the ending of the Jewish faith and the beginning of the Christian faith. If you remember all these years Jesus had been teaching these Pharisees and scribes and the Jews and part of them would listen and most of them wouldn't. And we're, we're talking now the last week of Christ's life. This is where he's at within the last three or four days of his life. He's predicting these things that's gonna come to pass this will forever end the Jewish deal. It's very important because there's some still hanging on even today. That's why it's so important that we grasp this and understand it. So let's read 27, and I'm sorry, 28 and 29. And when these things, let's back up 27. And then they will say, and then they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draws near. Now, we talked the last two or three weeks about the signs and the things that Jesus told them to look for that was going to take place before the destruction of Jerusalem. So they would know when it was going to come to pass. Some 30 years from now, 37, somewhere in that vicinity. Turn over to Luke, Luke 21. Let's look at verses 5 and 7. <clears throat> and remember, these are questions that they asked Jesus, and Jesus answered them and gave them the signs. Verse 5. Then as some spoke of the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and gifts, he said... As for these things that you behold, the days will come in which there will not be left one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And they ask him, saying, Teacher, but when will these things be, and what sign will there be when these things come to pass? Keep that in your mind. Turn over to Matthew chapter 24. 
verse 2 and 3. And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of your age? And the end of the age. Now turn, look at 24 and verse 35. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Now turn to Revel uh, Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. <clears throat> The revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave to him to show to his bondservants things that must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angels to his bondservant John. Who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things that are written in it. For the time is at hand. Keep in mind, all these things that we have read this morning are things that will shortly come to pass. Things that you will be standing, you will be alive when they come to pass. See where I'm going? This is not something that's going to take place at the end of time. This is things that are going to shortly come to pass. You'll stand, some of you standing here will not, will see these things before you die. It's a done deal, folks. There are so many people today that take these and run with them as if it's going to happen. And they're looking for all of these things. It's not. It's done. Happened. Brenda? Yeah. Well, there's, there's people that teach that. Yeah, yeah. In verse 27, it says, they will see it. That limits the events to the lifetime of those who Jesus is referring to. The destruction of Jerusalem would prove that Christ was in heaven and in control. Matthew 26 and verse 64. Turn over there right quick. Matthew 26, verse 64. <clears throat> Jesus said to him, You have said it nevertheless. I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming in the clouds of heaven. There again, they take this scripture and they run crazy with it because it talks about seeing the Son of Man coming in clouds. When you reference the Old Testament, Isaiah and several different other places, it talks a lot about Christ coming in the clouds. Coming in the clouds is a reference to, uh, it's to symbolism. Symbolism of the power of God. If you remember all through the wanderings, Christ, or God, appeared in a cloud, and he, he, got, he guided them, okay? It's not talking about the end of time per se. It's talking about the power of God in the destruction of Jerusalem. And in verse 28, redemption drawing near. I've got to find my place back. When these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, your redemption draws near. Lift up your heads and joyous expectations. Judaism had inflicted physical suffering and the gospel was being hindered. 
It's descriptive language that shows the passing away of Judaism and the coming of the Christian age, the church. If you remember all the, the burdens that the Jews had placed on their people, the traditional burdens and just different burdens, Judaism was a burdensome religion. It's going to be done away with. You Jews that have been living under this, you disciples, lift up your head, be joyous, because there's a better thing coming, and it's happening. It's going to happen. Take faith. No longer will Judaism be holding back Christianity after the destruction of Jerusalem. That's where it's headed. Thoughts, comments, anyone? I had to bring them things up because I think I passed over them too fast last week. Now he's going to begin in verse 29, a parable. Luke, Luke 22. 21, I'm sorry. Luke 21 and verse 29. He's going to, he's going to speak to him a parable. He's, uh, this parable that Jesus is going to lay out before me is something that even we can see today. It's something that we can relate to. We know when winter's over and summer's coming. You know, it, it, there's certain things that point to it every year. Sometimes it gets full two or three weeks, but generally speaking, it's a solid thing that we can rely on. In verse 30, 29, I'm sorry, he spoke to him in a parable. Behold the fig tree and all the trees. When they sprout leaves, you see and know of your own selves that summer is now near. So also when you see these things come to pass, know that the kingdom of God is near. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. And take heed yourselves, lest at any time your hearts are weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and cares of this life, and that day come upon you unexpectedly. For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth, Therefore, watch and always pray so that you may be able to escape all these things that are about to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. Here, Luke is not only talking so much about the destruction of Jerusalem and the things that are going to come to pass. He's saying, look at these signs that Jesus has given us. You know that destruction is near. Be ready. By the same token... We as Christians today have this same admonition. Be ready. Be ready. You know the end is coming. We don't know when, but it is coming. Be ready. Don't get caught up in everyday living, the cares of life, and put God aside because it will catch you just like getting caught in a snare. You have to be ready for you know not when he's coming. Same principle. Watch Jerusalem, folks. I've told you what's going to happen also in other places, you tell them, get out of Dodge. Don't get caught here. Don't go back to get your coat. Get out of Dodge. And it was a terrible, terrible destruction. The end of days when Christ comes together his own, if you're not ready, it's going to be a terrible destruction as well. You're going to be in trouble. There's no do-over button. You best be ready. Pay attention. Thoughts, comments? Yes. Being prepared uh, is not going to be any more. No, uh, uh, I mean, we have to understand that. We keep here. People, false doctrine has convinced people about looking for the signs yeah. and all this stuff, and they keep appointing to all these things that happen around us as signs. Yeah. But the Bible says that these things come and go over the ages. Yeah. They'll always be coming and going. That, you know, I mean, the only sign that Jesus promised was the sign of Jonah. And he's already performed that sign. You know, uh, uh, all we can do is follow the parables. Well, the, the women that had the lamps, you know, some didn't bring enough oil. And uh, that's what the parable is saying. Be ready. You don't know when he's going to show up. Yeah, there's and no, so, no know, time that's, out. That's, that's crucial. Yes. We need to get that sunk into our heads. Exactly. 
Brenda? Yeah. I, uh, you know, I believe it's talking about the the things just taking place before the destruction of Jerusalem. It's it's figuratively la language. How do you say it? Why? <clears throat> Yeah. The generation's been gone a long time, and there's some real old people. Yeah. So that's all, whatever. Exactly. Talking, whatever he's talking about. It happened during that generation, and we know that Jerusalem was the temple destroyed in Jerusalem. That was the main point I meant when I began class. These things will shortly come to pass. You're, you're, you're going to see these things. You're living here. And unless somebody's 4,000 years old, you know. Yes. Right. Now that generation. And I think part of the confusion is he talks about he talks about the end of age too and all of this. And it's hard to distinguish between the end of Jerusalem and the coming of Christ. It gets a little tied together with some of that. It does, but you gotta put the whole thing together. At this very point right here, his own apostles are still thinking of an earthly kingdom. The Jews are still thinking of an earthly kingdom. The apostles didn't catch on until the Holy Spirit visited them in Jerusalem. Not, yeah. yeah. Jerusalem, yeah. When the Holy Spirit fell upon them, they began to see signs and speak in tongues and different things. That's when, that's when the light turned on. Tink. Right. If you look back over in 21 and, and like in verse 19, in your, in your endurance, you will gain your souls. That is a profound statement if I ever heard one. If you take that and put it together after the Holy Spirit visited the apostles and they really went out and really started preaching the gospel with power. That's what he's talking about. Look at all the things that Paul suffered, all the things that Peter suffered, all the things that the, they went through, the persecution, the hatred, uh, the being talked about, the whole thing. And yet these men shine like stars in the sky. They never turned their back. They never weakened. They continued on head on even to their own deaths. Your endurance will save your souls. Same for us today. You've got to implant God's word into your heart. And you've got to live by it. You've got to mean it. You can't get caught up in things that's going on in the world around you and become slack. Because if you do, you will fall away. And that's what I was talking about earlier about our meetings. People will fall away once their habit is broken. If coming to church is a habit, so be it. You will gradually catch on. But if you're not here, you won't catch on. So, you know. Whatever it takes to get you into this building where we can teach you and preach to you, so be it. You're, it's not going to hurt you, okay? Everything you get here is going to be good for you. My uh, little sister told, oh, the only reason why you believe in God and, and Jesus is because you're weak and you can't take care of yourself. And she's right on. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. And she says, well, gay rights, there's nothing wrong with it. Oh. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't get me onto that. Ooh, that's that's one of my burrs under my saddle blanket. Okay, verse verse thirty seven. <clears throat> now in the daytime he was teaching in the temple, and at night he went out and stayed on the mount that is called Olivet. And all the people came early in the mornings to hear him in the temple, to hear him preach. I kind of messed that up, but. They thought enough about it and as inter interested enough in it that they got up early. They wanted to hear Christ. 
Remember now he's within three days of his death. Chapter 22, now the feast of the unleavened bread, which is called the Passover, drew near. Now the chief priests and scribes sought how they might kill him, but they feared the people. Then Satan entered into Judas, surnamed Isaacirit, belonging to the number of the twelve. So he went his way and discussed with the chief priests and officers how he might betray him to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. And he consented. Then he sought an opportunity to betray him to them in the absence of the multitude. Hold up right there a minute. Feast of the unleavened bread and the Passover. These are two different things. They are used interchangeably, but yet they are two different things. The feast of the unleavened bread lasted a week. The Passover, one day. Do you remember what the Passover was all about? It was to remember whenever they were still in uh, Egypt. Egypt. And the, the death angel comes through, and if they didn't have the blood of the lamb on their door yeah. facings, they first born in that family would die. But if they had the blood? If they had the blood, they would not. What, what is that symbolism for us? Is that not a symbolism where we're at right here? Huh? The blood, the blood of Christ. It's symbolism of Christ. Very important to the Jews. Uh, let me see. Uh, look at verse 3. Satan entered into Judas, surname Isaacirit. Did Satan just do that? Huh? Can Satan just zap me up here? Come into me, make me do something that's wrong. Huh? You th not now? You think he could do it then? Probably. <laughs> Larry? You know, if we look at how Eve was deceived, you yeah. know, Satan didn't eat that forbidden fruit. Uh, Adam didn't, I mean, Satan didn't eat it for Adam either. They did it under their own free will. There However, you go. The Bible specifically shows us what Satan told Eve to convince her that it was okay. Huh. So she was deceived, okay? Uh, and therefore, yes, Satan intervened her through this deception, but he didn't literally come in and do it. He didn't literally tell Pharaoh to kill everybody either, but he, he hardened his heart. How did he harden his heart? He deceived him. That's all. That's what the Bible says. So, and we see that how we're deceived, and in, in, in we can fall into sin too. Yeah. So that's how that happens. Yeah, Danny. Uh, it was already in, in his mind. Yeah. In her mind. Weakness. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, if you go back, it's in Matthew. He was in charge of the purse. Yeah. 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 Exactly. That basically, like you said, it was in his character from the beginning. He just finally just let it happen. Free will is free will. Free will. Yeah. Okay. I thought that was important. Can I back up just a little bit? Sure. Can you tell me the difference between unleavened bread and the Passover? They're, they're, you said they were different. I thought they were the same. There were two different feasts. No, I can't tell you because I didn't research what the feast of the unleavened bread was. All I know is I did read it starts on the feast of the unleavened bread begins on the 15th of, I believe it said April. And continues through the 21st. That is the way it was. The Passover was on the 15th, if I ain't mistaken, or the 21st. I forget which. The Passover was just a one-day deal. I can't tell you what the difference is. No. I didn't research it out. And it, it, most times it's used interchangeably together as one. But there are actually two separate things. 
may, may pertain to the same thing. Okay. Why? Passover was coming to unleavened bread was established way before the Passover. Okay. So you got that was part of the original law. And yes, it was part of it. They had, they had incorporated it in, which was the Passover. I don't know if they continued to keep the, the long time or just a short time. I, I don't I haven't researched it. It's kind of like the doctor. But I do know they, they were at the same time, and it, since the Passover was more important yes. than the unleavened bread in the mind of the Jews, then they took it as the Passover. Yeah, did you hear all that, Tommy? Yeah, but I, I, I thought the unleavened bread was instituted at the same time after the Passover. No, I think it was prior. Exodus 12, 17 through 20. Finish it. That tells about the feast for a week. Okay. They remove everything out of the house. Yes. Right. Did you get it, Tommy? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. To that's all right. I mean, that's what class is all about. If you can't get your questions answered, then we need to find somebody else. Yeah, there was a difference. I just wanted to ask. Okay, they had all kinds of feasts. They had feast of the tabernacle, feast of the harvest. You know, different things. So the Passover is when they passed over. Right. And didn't uh, they didn't die? Right, right. Symbolism of Christ for us today, Wayne. The New King James reads down the feast of cross on the eleventh bread. Drew near, drew near, which is called a Passover. Yeah. That's, that's a, this, these different versions of it. Okay. Any other thoughts, comments? Everybody got that? All right. We are in verse 8. No, I'm sorry, verse 7. Then the day of the unleavened bread came when the Passover lamb must be killed. And he sent Peter and John saying, Go and prepare for us the Passover so that we may eat. And they said to him, Where do you want us to prepare it? And he said to them, Behold, when you have entered into the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him to the house which he enters. And you will say to the owner of the house, The teacher says to you, where is the guest room in which I will eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large furnished upper room. There, make ready. You know, I, <clears throat> I did study a little bit about this. And Jesus could have very well said, go to such and such. There, you'll find it. But he went kind of a roundabout way. Well, there's some claim, well, Jesus had made prior arrangements with this man. Not so. This is showing us the omniscience of Christ. Also, for another reason, perhaps, Judas was fixing to betray Christ. It couldn't happen until certain things had happened. Had Judas knew where they were going to have this Passover feast, he could have went to the priest and said, they're going to be in this house right here in this room at such and such time. Then they would have come and arrested Jesus, and part of the things that Jesus had yet to do would not be completed, would it? So he uses the omniscience, and, the, you know, it worked out. Judas didn't have a clue where it was at until he followed the others up there. He didn't betray him until after the Lord had instituted the Lord's Supper, the last meal. All of these things come together. We see Christ is not through yet. He's still got some things he got to accomplish. He knows the crucifixion is getting closer by the minute. But he's still got certain things he has to accomplish before that happens, that the scriptures may be fulfilled. Prophecies. 
Comments, thoughts? Okay. Another odd thing. I forgot about it. You don't see men carrying pitchers of water in that day. Women did that, not men. Pitcher of water. That was a woman's job. Shows us the omni, I don't know how you say that word exactly. I call it omniscience. If that ain't right, you know what I'm trying to say. Uh, where am I at? Verse 13, now they went and found as he had said to them, and they made ready the Passover. Then when the hour had come, he sat down and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks, and he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And when he had took the bread and gave thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you. Thoughts and comments. <clears throat> I know there's got to be some questions about that. You notice it says Passover supper. They actually ate a meal, right? Hmm? Yes, it was. Just like, just like in Corinthians uh, chapter 11, where, where he's uh, talking about the fact that they came together and they're gluttoning themselves, you know, and not waiting for the others and stuff. He told them about if you're going to eat a meal, eat it at home. Yeah. You know, a lot of men at home, you know, uh. worship too. But he's, he definitely gave the separation of the event of what they were doing. They was two separate things, yes. Why did he earnestly desire to eat the Passover meal? Danny, you got your hand up? You got a funny look. <laughs> well, go ahead and ask your question. <laughs> See, that's what happens when you're up here and somebody asks you something from the left corner and it ain't nowhere in your mind. You got that funny look on your face. Yeah, Brenda. <laughs> I just want to say that the Passover meal, I mean, that the Passover was a meal. Yes, it was. And the Lord's Supper is similar. There is, yes, closeness, yes. It, the meal, it was a special meal. It, it's, it by itself was still prepared with unleavened stuff, you know. Brenda? Did they understand? No, they did. Huh? But they would remember. They would remember. You know, when somebody tells you something, and I know it happens to all of us, somebody's told you something that's going to happen, and it's the furthest thing from your mind. And I'm not saying they're soothsayers or prophecies or whatever, but as soon as it does happen, the light comes. I remember him telling me about that. How did he know that? The light will come on for these fellas later. Brenda? Well, they're getting this one little piece at a time as they live their life. Yes. We've seen it as a whole picture now. Yes. But they, they, they couldn't see the whole picture because they hadn't been finished yet. That's very true. Very true. Anyone else? Wayne? What about 18? Verse 18. We'll not drink a fruit of wine until. Kingdom of God comes. Okay. 
How do you get around that? The kingdom of God comes. What? Is he speaking of the church? Or is yes. he speaking of the kingdom of heaven? Speaking of the church. You know, every first day of the week when we assemble, and, and I mentioned some of this last week, that is part of our worship service. I'm sorry. That is part of our worship service, gathering around the table, doing in remembrance. It's important. Do you not believe that as Christians that when we assemble around this table and humble ourselves and offer a prayer for these emblems, the Christ is not in our midst at that very moment? Probably more so than any other time in our lives, each first day of the week. That's what he's talking about in verse 18. I'll not do it until the kingdom's been established. He does it every first day of the week with us. Danny? Not only in the time that we fellowship together, we fellowship with Christ himself. That's why it's so important that if you don't do it right, you eat and drink damnation upon yourself. That's why it's so important that we not have the ham in the oven on our mind when this is going on. Wayne? It's, it's a, well, no, it's an ongoing deal for everyone. Everyone's mind wonders. And, you know, by the same token, there are those, I ain't going to name names, that don't do it every Sunday. They just do it once every so often for the very reason they say, well, if you do it every, every week, well, first thing you know, you, you're just doing it because you're supposed to be doing it. No, that ain't true. You can have the type of heart and mind that's necessary when you do this every first day of the week. You can do that. I'm not saying your mind's not going to wander a little, but you can do it. You can be holy while this is going on. It's something you, we all have to work on. And it, it is important. But I want to say again, it's not any more important than all the rest of it. It's all a package deal. It takes all of it to be pleasing to God, not just one. It takes all of it. It used to be a common practice of people to sit on the back and take to the Lord's Supper and leave. Yeah. And, and I don't know, that I guess goes back to what the Catholics do where you have to come in and do something once a week. That, that the, the Lord's Supper does not remove sins. It's not no. even designed. <laughs> exactly. It doesn't purify you. Take it. Right. It's a remembrance. It's a memorial. It's, a, it's, what, it's not a celebration. It's a memorial. Something that we all need to work on, and it's something that we need to be serious about. Yes. Yes. Well, it keeps us separate, you might say. When he says he waits until the Lord comes, and I was reading Mark 14, 25, and he'll drink up with when he comes in the time comes. What, what's your question? That's, am I reading that right? <laughs> well, 
yeah, you know, I mean. He, he partakes with it every first day of the week, just like we do. Yeah. In spirit. In spirit. In spirit. And so that's what we need that is the union, the unionness. That's not a good word. That is the unity that we as Christians share with Christ. Danny? It's the bond, the uniqueness of being separate from the world, I guess is a good way of putting it. Our memory is very important. Yes. Uh, we remember our loved ones, friends. It's our, it takes time to remember them uh, and, and effort to remember them because oftentimes people get very busy. And so this is a wonderful thing to remember Christ and the things that he did for us. It's very important. All right, we're out of time. Brother Michael Jackson's going to preach to us here in a minute, so let's get revved up for that. Thank you for your attention.